Okay, so uh, we'd like to welcome everyone at this uh, BenQ uh, event that we're doing, this webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to actually watch this presentation. So I'm going to stop with Gandalf here because I think you guys probably heard enough of him. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to present the first ever Hugo's Desk VFX webinar. And this is a webinar brought to you by BenQ. And mostly today I want to talk about compositing and grading inside of Nuke. But please keep in mind that everything that we are going to talk about in this uh, webinar um, will also be possible to be used on other applications as well. Basically, this is going to be what we are going to talk about today. Um, just wanted to give you like a rundown of what we're going to do. I'm going to start by an introduction of my work. Uh, basically, you know, for those of you that don't know me, and also for those of you that, uh, you know, just recently started following Yugo's Desk, I uh, wanted to introduce my work. I also want to introduce my studio because most of the techniques that I'm showcasing today are very relevant to the studio uh, that I work, which is called Yugo's Desk, of course. And then I have have some fundamental equipment that I would like to talk about. And of course, um, I have a grading workshop that will be done inside of Nuke. And then at the very end, after we finish the workshop, we have about a we have a QA. I'm gonna start by introducing myself. So my name is Zugu Gerre, and as you can see, uh, I am a big fan of doing silly photos on events of games and visual effects. Um, and I am from Portugal, and Portugal is this little country in Europe, on the corner of Europe. I am I'm from Porto, and um, Porto is very well known for its port wine, uh, of course. And when I was very young, this is me when I was six years old, and this is, of course, relevant to the story because it gets into what I've been doing lately. Uh, I always wanted to be a pianist. That was my main thing. I didn't really want to be a visual effects artist. I wanted to be a pianist. But in the meantime, I couldn't really do that. Um, so my father asked me, uh, if I would like to have a bicycle for uh, my birthday, this was when I was six years old, or if I wanted a Sinclair Spectrum computer. Now, you guys probably know what my answer was. Basically, I decided to get a Spectrum. Now, I don't know if you guys, you're probably all too young to know this because I am, of course, 40, um, but we used to use uh, Spectrums to play games, um, and these games used to come on a tape recorder. Um, you probably don't know that. Uh, which would actually be an audio cassette, which would break a lot. And then once it finally loaded, which would take like 45 minutes long to load, uh, basically you would get these amazing graphics. Just look at this, this photorealism and amazing uh, cutting edge graphics for Robocop from Data East, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Many years later, um, you know, I because of that computer, I became very obsessed obsessed by computer graphics, and I got very obsessed by filmmaking. So I went to an art school in uh, in Portugal called Ezad, which is a, a an art, and I made my degree in fine arts. That's my background. Back then, you know, this is like the uh, early '90s, so basically you couldn't really have a visual effects degree, you would have to go to an art school. And what I did, and, and after doing a degree in arts and working on um, uh, for a while as a freelancer, I became a visual effects artist. Now, visual effects artist is usually someone that you can notice uh, in the distance whenever you see someone that has no tan whatsoever. That's the visual effects artist. So that's me over there with no tan, completely white, and with nothing else. Um, now, I've been working for about... 20 years in the industry, I've worked on many different places. These are just some of the companies that I worked. I've worked for the BBC, I've worked for Nexus, for Jellyfish, at the mill, Keyword Studios with Fire.Smoke, and of course, Hugo's Desk, which is my current company. And um, now at the mill, that was the majority of my time uh, as a professional in London. And at the mill, I was the head of the Nuke compositing department. In case you guys want to know where my background comes from, because, um, of course, I'm doing a compositing um, <laughs> workshop, so you probably want to know if I know what I'm talking about. So, I, yeah, I used to be the head of Nuke at the mill, and we had, like, a department for, you know, I was there for almost five years, and our department was about 20 to 30 people, depending on how many projects we had. And I, my, my goal was to supervise. So a lot of times I would be on set supervising. This is me when I was younger. 
um, you know, being on set, supervising, making sure all the HDRIs are done, making sure all the visual effects are shot correctly. I would also, of course, uh, eventually do a lot of jobs as a director as well, uh, especially uh, on a lot of green screen shoots um, and kind of got specialized as a visual effects supervisor and also, you know, filmed a lot of my B unit and I filmed a lot and I know a lot about cameras. So I, of course, had the enjoyment of a lot of times being uh, the B cam of some of my productions. So, of course, you know, being on set, uh, I learned a lot because, of course, when you're on set, you really understand the problems that exist on set and the speed that the set has to go. Sometimes, a lot of times, you're just scratching your head trying to understand what you can achieve. And so these days, you know, after my career, this is what we do, you know, as visual effects artists. We basically photograph something realistic and make this. I'm, of course, this is a joke, but that's kind of like what we're doing these days. Um, if you guys want to see my website, it's hugo Uh You can see some of my latest work there. I've lately been working mostly on the games industry. And this is some of my work. I've, I did a lot of lead compositing when I was at uh, Nexus. You know, these are some of the CG. I got quite specialized on CG compositing. And these are some of the work I've done at Nexus. Of course, the mill as well. I supervised the Call of Duty Ghost cinematics and supervised a lot of commercials for Adidas and supervised a lot of commercials for Nike. And, and basically, like, we pretty much did everything. You know, we had SIF commercials. We, you know, like body count uh, cinematics. We, I think... That's the cool thing of working at a place like The Mill. You end up working on almost every type of production that exists to man. So these are just some of the productions that I was involved while I was there, either as the head of Nuke or as a VFX supervisor, sometimes as a composter or sometimes as a lead composter, you know, including the Howdy Hummingbird, which was uh, got a lot of awards as well. And culminating with the BBC um, uh, music, uh, D Love commercials that we did, uh, a lot of puppetry, like as you can see on your screen there, and of course also the BBC music uh, uh, music video, which was a lot, my last project I did at the mill, which you know had Pharrell in it, and you had uh, you know Stevie Wonder, it had Kylie Minogue. It was a really big project that I was on set lately. I've Ever since I left the mill, I've been working a lot on the games industry. So these are some of the game studios that I've worked for lately, including the last project I did, which was for Games Workshop and for Fat Shark. And these are some of the games that I've been working as either a cinematic director, uh, doing trailers, or maybe doing the intro trailer, like the case of you know Homefront Revolution, uh, or even Warhammer Vermintide 2. So some of these projects, uh, we did trailers, sometimes we did cinematics, sometimes we did in-game cinematics. Really depends on the project um, on the screen here. And these are some of the game trailers that I was involved. You know, uh, Mario vs. Rabbits was a big achievement. We had stuff for, done for the crew. We had stuff done for Assassin's Creed as well. Uh, we did stuff for Watch Dogs 2. You know, I've been involved on projects for The Division as well, doing live action trailers for The Division. We did uh, CG trailers for Until Dawn. We did, um, you know, CG trailers for Just Cause 3. Uh, especially, this was a really favorite of mine uh, for Just Cause 3 when it launched. And also Walking Dead. And of course, also Homefront The Revolution, which you guys have probably, some of you seen some of my videos on YouTube about that um, as well. So we did a lot of projects there. Um, I have also have a second life. I've been a teacher for a long time uh, on all these places. And I do a lot of workshops. This is a workshop I did in Porto. Uh, there's also a workshop here done at the National Film Television School. Um, I've done a lot of conferences all over the world. So if you guys ever go to conferences, just you know, say 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 hello and come and join me. And and uh, these are some of the <laughs> photos of the conferences that I've done. Um, and and so. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, and that's why I wanted to do this workshop about color correction and engraving, is my workflow. So when I left the mill, I kind of left the mill and decided to work from home. And the reason I decided to work from home was really this, like I was really pretty tired of, you know, of basically being squashed on commuting and I wanted to have a bit of a different way of working. And also, to be honest, like I was a little bit fed up of having my clients always next to me, uh, you know, basically moving furniture around. Um, not, to, not to say that I don't have clients right now. Of course, I have clients now, but it's different. You know, it's different because you tend to uh, be remote and you tend to work on your office and you can only have your client through email. So this, of course, was a progressive thing. Over the last three years, I started working remotely by working in coffee shops, working on set, uh, traveling with my Mac Pro, you know, going and working with my client. That was something my clients really enjoyed. 
taking my equipment with me, going to hotel rooms, you know, and, and of course, I also also did a lot of work where I worked with the client in their office. So this is, for example, an example that I pack up my YouTube, my basically my, my studio and went and worked for a couple of months um, at Ubisoft Paris, where we basically set up shop with my team. We had like about five people here and we kind of worked just like I was on my office, but on their office at Ubisoft. And so in a way I started working from home. And of course, working from home means a lot of people think it's like working with FTP and it's not. Like I, I have a much more advanced way of working. I have a proper pipeline. I'm not using FTP because FTP, of course, is crap and no one wants to use it. And also, I think for me, like the democratization of software these days really helped you uh, to not need a proper pipeline. You know, in the past, work on big companies, you would have to have a complete pipeline recreated from scratch. And these days, there's a lot of softwares from the shelf that you can just use. Uh, I think this GIF is really a great way to represent that. When back in the day, no one really understood what computers were about. And now it's so much more democratic. And so this, this is my main pipeline, and it's some of the pipeline you're going to discuss today. My main pipeline revolves around F-Track uh, for, uh, you know, basically um, getting all the shots to my artists. I usually have a team of around 10 to 20 people, sometimes five people. Nook Studio for the conforming everything, Skype for communication, Dropbox Enterprise in business. And then around that, we have some satellite softwares. We have, of course, Nuke for composting, Mari for modeling, Maya for modeling animation, Modo for modeling as well. Mari for painting and texture, Redshift for rendering, uh, Photoshop, um, Photoshop for matte paintings, Houdini for particles and effects, and of course, Final Cut for editorial. Now, this is, for example, just an example of what I'm talking about. These days, I work remotely, and this is my team, for example. This is when we were doing Heroes Arena, which was a game cinematic I did last year in full CG. And as you can see here, we have our animation team and CG team and CG lead. Juan Brockhaus is working from Germany on his own office. Then I have Wells here, one of my animators. He's actually working from his house in London. And then also down here, you don't really see it, but you have Bjorn as well in Iceland, and I myself, I'm in Britain as well. So we kind of start getting used to having dailies every day and working like this. This kind of goes back to what I was starting, and that's why I wanted to talk about um, uh, color correction on this uh, webinar. Uh, my desk, my studio is really this. This is my studio. And, and of course, a lot of people, when they think that I work from home, they think, oh, he just has a laptop. I really don't have a laptop. I have more equipment on my office, on my home office, than most people have. And so this is the majority of the equipment that I'm going to kind of show today and also show in action. Uh, in the middle of this equipment, I have three 4K monitors. They're all uh, three monitors. They're all very different. You know, I have the, SD, the SW320 from, uh, from BenQ, which is a photography monitor. I have the PV3200, which is a video production monitor. And then I have the PD3200, which is a, a design monitor, which allows me to like jump from project to project. Uh, also, working from home gives you this kind of advantage. You can have st stuff like this. Uh, you know, like if you're working on a facility, you can't really have this kick ass uh, uh, mouse pad. Just look at it. It's just beautiful. It's like one of the most beautiful <laughs> mouse pads I've ever seen in my life. Um, so I really like it. Um, now, on one side of my desk, I have most of my professional gear. So I have the BenQ 10 bit monitor to preview my things, I have my rate system down here. I have my sound card, of course, as well. Then I have some scopes uh, for Blackmagic, professional scopes. And I have, of course, a Rex 9 video monitor there as well. On top of my tower of monitors, I have my little amiibos as well to make me company when I'm working uh, so that I can <clears throat> look at them and just glance at how beautiful they are. Uh, on the bottom here, I have my rate system. <clears throat> and then I have my tangent balls. Sorry by saying that they are bolts. Uh, basically, they are the way I actually call it correct inside of DaVinci and the way I call it correct inside of Final Cut. I really recommend them. They're quite cheap and, and they do enough. It, they also work in Nuke, in Nuke Studio, but it's a bit more tricky to set up, but it does work. Um, then on the other side, I have some of my uh, recreational stuff. I have recreational stuff by the, you know, I have my Xbox, my PlayStation, uh, of course, my Super Nintendo Mini, my NES Mini, and of course, a lot more games in a hub so I can play. So because I work on the games industry, I have to, of course, play a lot of games. And of course, I love playing games. On the other side, I also like just going to make a little apart here. I have like a Dreamcast. I have a Wii U. I also have like my PlayStation VR, which I really enjoy. And then on this side, now I'm really 
geeking out. I have all my other consoles. I have the Atari Jaguar, the Xbox One. Not the Xbox One One, the Xbox One. The, the actual original one. Uh, the Panasonic 3DO, the PlayStation 2, the Mega Drive, Mega CD, the Amiga 32X, the Nintendo 64, the GameCube, another Dreamcast, a Japanese Dreamcast, PlayStation 3, and a Sega Saturn, and a bunch of mobile um, uh, consoles. Now, you guys now have seen that I'm a huge geek and nerd. So what's under the hood on my equipment? My studio runs mainly on this machine. So this is my main machine. It's the Mac Pro 6.1, the trash bin, uh, which is specced out. I have 12 cores of, of, uh, of CPU. I have 64 gigs of RAM, dual graphics with 60 gigs each. It outputs a 10-bit signal from DisplayPort. It has like a total 32, uh, 36 terabytes of RAID 0 running at 1,000 frames per second, uh, megs per second. And of course, a Blackmagic Decklink 4K and an external PCI export enclosure. I also have more machines. I have more machines to help me. I have three more Mac Pros. So you saw under that table, I have all these Mac Pros and they kind of like help me to render. Sometimes they help me to be my second machine of editorial. So if I want to like um, uh, have an edit on Nuke Studio where I'm working and then I have a composite on another machine, I can have multiple machines. So these machines are all spec'd out as well. There are actually three Mac Pros 5.1 with dual six core CPUs with 128 gigs of RAM. Some of them have have a Radio Pro uh, HX7100, others have a Quadro P5000, others have a Quadro K5000, but they all are kind of like my support machines. I also including have a Cubix um, uh, PCI slot so that I can have more PCI slots into my machines. And they're all connected using um, a 10-bit gigabit internet. So basically they're all connected on 10 uh, gig. Um, I also should say I have, I still have connected my two old Power G, uh, my G3 and my G4, and the reason I have these is because I still sometimes uh, dwell into old software. This is my little collection of uh, retro and old software. We'll talk more about this on Hugo's desk. I'm going to start opening some of these boxes and kind of like sharing some of these 80s, including my favorite, which is Adobe Photoshop 2 from the 90s. I still have it fully packed and sealed. <clears throat> so, and then you probably want to wonder what's on the other side of Hugo's desk. So, on the other side of Hugo's desk, you have my, basically, my library of inspiration, uh, which you don't usually see it on my channel. And this is very important for my color correction pipeline, because uh, a lot of these books, you know, I have, like, my Cinefax collection here. I have a lot of books about moving and filmmaking. I have a lot of games books. And especially I have hundreds of art of books. And of course I have my cameras and my lenses and everything. Uh, now, it's very important for you to kind of keep track of all these art books. You can have them on, on uh, Kindle, of course, but I prefer to have them physically. The reason I keep all these books here is that every time I'm doing a grade, every time I'm doing color correction, every time I'm finishing or directing a project, I very much uh, tend to use them to use them uh, as references, you know, like I use them, uh, you know, if you want to know how a scene looks on New York on the 20s, you can look at a game like that. If you want to look at Victorian uh, London to to help on a reference for a grade, you can then watch Assassin's Creed Syndicate, for example. Uh, so that's really like a big thing that I have here on the back. Of course, I'm very proud as well that just a few weeks ago, I I, find, I, I, I got three Tele Awards from my work as director. Uh, basically, I got a Tele Award from Homefront Revolution, one for The Walking Dead, and one for Visual Effects for Homefront as well. Now, of course, you saw my photo. When I work, I don't usually work that bright that you saw. Um, I work on a much darker environment. So the cool thing about my desk is that I can lower all my lights and I can actually have very little light when I'm doing color correction. And that's usually the ideal way you want to do color correction. Um, and so um, now fundamental equipment that I really want to make sure you guys know that I have for me, it's fundamental, and you're going to see why, it's fundamental that you have a Decklink, uh, a Blackmagic card, or better, an SDI or an HDMI card that you can actually see a full output of Nuke. It can be a Blackmagic card, it can be also an Azure card, it doesn't really need to be Blackmagic, or if you have the money to spend, you can use a Bluefish 444, which are the most advanced ones. Some of them are actually 4K HDR as well. And this is fundamental for you to preview your work, 
And, and as you can see here on this video, this is very common for me to work this way. I basically have you know, either Nuke or DaVinci or Nuke Studio or Photoshop or After Effects running on my main monitor. And then my full video output is always displayed on an actual real video output. This is very important because then you can have the correct frame rate, you can have the correct color space, you can have everything correct for that video output. Um, so basically, this is uh, also another example. This is me doing some color correction for Assassin's Creed. And as you can see, I have my main desktop running my software, and then my Blackmagic output outputs a, a true video signal on 10-bit to my display so that I can use it as a color correction uh, tool. Again, the same thing here goes in for Walking Dead, where I directed this and did the color correction. And again, I have my output video going in to an SW320 so that I can actually see... Uh, no, sorry, this is the SW271 from BenQ, so I can see a 10-bit monitor there. Um, now, in terms of monitors, these are the ones I use. I use the PV series, which is uh, specifically created for video color correction. And they are, you know, Technicolor supported uh, certified monitors in with 10-bit panels, and they are 4K as well. Um, so I use them as my main reference for my desktop. And then I use the SW series, the SW320 for photography, for Photoshop, and of course for color correction, and especially if I want to preview HDR as well. I also use it for playing games as well, which is terrific as well. Um, uh, if you guys want to know how I can deal with all these computers together, as you saw, I have four main computers, uh, which are those four Mac Pros. I also have two Mac Minis as well running on the background. I use this software called Synergy. It really allows you to, s to seamlessly go from one... Um, from one machine to the other with the same mouse and same keyboard. Unfortunately, it doesn't support Wacom tablets just yet. And the reason I'm using like these professional monitors is really because it allows me to be very precise on my color correction. I can use a specific Gamma 2.4, or I can use a specific Rex Amazon 9, or I can use a specific uh, uh, sRGB or an HDR output or a P3 output, depending on what I'm delivering. So sometimes I'm doing posters for the web, sometimes I'm doing color correction for YouTube, sometimes I'm doing a TV commercial. So depending on my project, I can adapt my color space to what I need. Also goes without saying, you should always try to get a video monitor. The cheapest ones you can find are Smart Video 4K and the Smart Video H HD. And you can see here from one of my videos, this is the, the way I've set it up. Like I have my 10-bit display here uh, previewing my entire image. And then I have like this Blackmagic uh, 4K display, which is an 8-bit display. And then I have my scopes. And then I have 6-bit displays down here. The reason I have so many displays watching the same thing is because you probably have already had these issues with some clients where some of the clients don't really know exactly what kind of uh, color correction or it, they probably haven't calibrated the monitors you know so a lot of times you have to like have a lot of different outputs to make sure you can cover yourself you cover your basics uh, because you know maybe someone has a, a laptop that is not calibrated for years and um, and also um, I would recommend you to use Scopebox, which is a, a really nice software to do scopes uh, if you don't have the money to have real scopes. Um, and this is actually an application you can install. The way I use it is basically I use it on a second monitor so that I can use scopes. So for example, if I'm like traveling and I can't take my scopes with me, I use them as a software so that I can have my scopes for doing color correction. Um, now... The scopes, of course, will need a separated recorder, so basically have to loop the video. The video actually basically comes out of your Nuke SDI out and then goes in to, for example, this thing, which is a mini recorder, which basically allows you to bring in the signal back into the computer so you can use the scopes that way. Um, also, for you to, you know, a serious compositor that is trying to do color correction needs to calibrate their monitors very well. So I would recommend you to use the DVDO AV Lab uh, TGP. G, sorry, it's a mouthful. And this is a really good um, object to actually bake, make color uh, charts and make uh, sharpen charts. So basically, you can do color bars. You can check your output. You can basically do uh, b basic cubes and and sharpen sharpen mask so that you can actually check the calibration of your monitor. Now this together with Kalman Studio, which is a software that together with the with the, with the, um, a color meter you can actually calibrate. So basically you need to have this object here, which is the DVDO, which outputs your test patterns. 
then the test patterns are there and basically you can use Cal Studio to basically measure it with uh, photometry you know and you can use pretty much a lot of them I use usually use the right eye display pro um, this of course is calibrating the software itself so this is the BenQ software that comes with the application and basically you just open up the little uh, thing here and you can then calibrate your screen so I do these two types of calibrations I calibrate my screen with the palette master from BenQ so that that means I calibrate it to Adobe RGB, I calibrate it to sRGB, I also calibrate to Rexon 09, and I'm calibrating it to a gamma of 2.4 so that I can calibrate it for color correction. And then on the side, I also calibrate with the Calman Studio, I calibrate my actual SDI output uh, separately. That's pretty much it for my equipment. Let's jump into the workshop. Um, so the But before I do the workshop, I just wanted to share with you my studio so that I can kind of like show you a little bit of what's going on here. So as you can see, um, this is what I was telling you about. Um, this is uh, Nuke running here on um, uh, SDI out, outputting uh, uh, CN. On this side here, I have another computer, another Mac Pro. And so this is the, the kind of way that I work. Sometimes I have one Mac Pro in the middle, and then I can have another Mac Pro there, or I can have another Mac Pro on the side. So I can have three Mac Pros, and then I can seamlessly go from one to another. For, for example, if, imagine I have Photoshop here on the photography monitor so that I'm using Adobe RGB if I want to. And then on the middle, I can have my Nuke script. And then on the side here, I can have my support Mac Pro to have more scripts. Now, on a click of a button, I can, of course, jump and have uh, other displays. So, for example, if I want, I can also have the same, uh, you know, if I just jump into here to HDMI, for example, I can then see on this screen the same exact thing that I see on that screen there. Uh, and so I'm going to just, sorry, I just outputted the wrong HDMI, of course. Um, so I'm just going to switch on my monitor here. Uh, I'm also going to switch it on here. Yeah, there we go. So now it's actually showing on both screens. So sorry about that. So it took me a while to go swapping. So as you can see now, I have my black magic here to output my normal 8-bit Rex 09 video and that will help me to kind of see how a normal television makes an image look like and uh, then i have my scopes these are my normal scopes you don't see image here because these two screens are only hd so you won't see image right now because i'm displaying a 4k image these scopes are very important for me for color correction especially to know the temperature scope and also the actual luminance scope as well on this side, I have a 10-bit monitor that is displaying Rex and Zonine at the moment. And this can also be switched to HDR. So this is the SW320. And then on the other side here, on this side here, I have the PD series, which is now outputting Rex and Zonine, or I can switch it to sRGB. So imagine if I was doing um, a YouTube video, uh, you know, imagine if I was delivering a cinematic for YouTube, then I can swap to sRGB and then basically grade to sRGB instead of grading to Rex and Zonine. So that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this for a moment here and actually go back into Nuke. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start with this first really simple workshop, and it's not really a workshop. It's mostly like to talk to you really about how important it is for you actually to know what you're getting. So the crucial fact for you to know what kind of color correction you're making is to know what you're bringing into your compositing application. So for example, I'll give you an example. This is footage from Homefront Revolution. These are raw red files. Um, so these are actual real red files, which I have processed and checked inside the Red Cine X Pro. Now, the reason I use the Red Cine X Pro is because it's made by Red, you know, and, and you kind of want to use the software that they used from scratch. So, and in here, I can kind of see the metadata of the Red file. I can kind of look in here and see what color, color space was shot. Of course, normally when I work in this kind of environment, I have been on set, so because I was on set, I know exactly what color space they used on the camera. I've made note of that, and that's really important when you actually go into Nuke. Now, lately in Nuke, I've been using the ISIS color space, and at the moment, for example, when I'm looking at this, you can kind of see that this is a red file uh, raw. And again, like I said, all these things can actually be done on any software. It doesn't need to be really Nuke. The way ACES works is that it allows you to either input with a specific color space from a specific camera. So in this case, I'm bringing in my red file from the red wide gamut RGB. And this is because it was shot like that, this specific piece of footage. But sometimes I've shot with color three, sometimes I've shot with color two. It really depends. And of course, if you have an Adi camera, you would then have to 
uh, switch this into an Adi camera or a Canon camera. Unfortunately, Blackmagic is not listed here, and that really makes it really difficult. And whenever, whenever I get Blackmagic footage, what I have to do is I convert it to something else. So in this case, I'm, I usually convert Blackmagic footage into Adi footage. Um, now, so, the, and of course, the ACES color space, which, of course, this keep in mind that this is like a 20-minute workshop. There's no way I'm going to teach you all of it in one single workshop. I really would advise you to basically just, you know, check up some of my other videos, and then you can kind of have follow-up color space uh, videos about that as well. The other thing as well that I like about ACES is that ACES allows you to actually have an output monitor a LUT, which would match what you're viewing it. Like right now I am using Rexon 9 ACES. The reason I'm doing that is because basically I am displaying this, you know, like I showed you uh, on my video here, this here, this monitor, this is the PV3200. Uh, and so that means it's I've set it to Rec 709 on the menu. So I basically went to the menu settings and set it to Rec 709. And so for it to match the monitor, I'm also using Rec 709 LUT on my viewer. Now, if you and also the other reason I also use um, red uh, sin to convert my files is because I always want to kind of check them if they match. So for right now, I can clearly see that this file here, which is the actual raw file from the red file, is actually matching the same exact color space inside of Nuke. I can see that it matches on my displays as well, which is great. So this is like kind of like um, a very small introduction to ACES, but that's how it usually works whenever you work in ACES. Basically, when you're working in ACES, you kind of want to make sure you have your LUT on your viewer. Uh, well, first of all, actually, the settings as well. So basically, the settings of ACES that I usually run with are kind of almost the default ones, but they're not quite the default ones. So I'm usually running 8-bit and 16-bits as sRGB textures. I then have my log files as Adi log, depending on what camera we shot, of course. If it was another camera, you would have to change that to another type of camera. Uh, the float files are usually, I usually use a huger gamut as well. And then the main working space is ACES uh, CG, which is usually the main space that I use for color correction of these cinematics and, and game trailers that I make usually. Now, um, it's all very new, of course. I haven't done a lot of productions with this kind of color space. Um, and ultimately, uh, you'll see more and more on my YouTube channel productions, including this one, which is not out yet, which is a, a trailer that I'm doing uh, for a game that I can't tell you. Um, you will see later on. So that's kind of like the, the basics of ACES. Of course, there's a lot of documentation out there, but keep in mind that you need to make sure your settings on your color project settings are correct which means you want to make sure your monitor is set to whatever color space you have on your monitor, make sure your textures are coming in as sRGB, depending if you've done them uh, on sRGB or not. And also don't forget to make sure that on your inputs, you have the actual correct color space of the camera in question. In this case, I have all these cameras set to red, white, gamut, RGB, because that is the actual color space that I have on these files, and you can check them on the metadata of Red Scene X uh, Professional. Now, um, so I'm going to just uh, jump into another shot here to show you. Um, now, keep in mind, of course, that um, we're doing this. Uh, we, we don't have a lot of time, so, of course, I'm, I'm doing it as fast as I can, but there is a lot of follow-up videos that have to happen later on. Um, I'm just going to open up another script here. Now, this is a piece of footage uh, coming from Blackmagic. So, because unfortunately I don't have the actual ACES LUT for Blackmagic, this is actually a piece of footage uh, shot with um, an, um, a Blackmagic uh, Mini Pro. Um, uh, uh, you know, so, so basically it's 4.6K. Uh, it was shot on RAW. And because ACES doesn't have an input... Uh, for that camera, I had to use ACES CG. The reason I did that was because I pre-conformed these footage from um, Cinema DNG in DaVinci. I can I basically linearize them. I convert them to linear inside of DaVinci. So they've already been pre-linearized, and you can kind of see that they still have all the dynamic range that they should have inside of the image, especially on the books here, on the bookshelves here. You can kind of see that it's really, really much, much... Um, 
much brighter than it is. I also have the Rec709 Aces color space on the viewer because that's what I'm viewing it through. And then uh, inside, inside my monitors here, I have this option here. So you see down here, I have enabled monitor outputs. If I enable this, I then can start seeing my outputs on my SDI. Um, I can either have video legal range. If I'm delivering it to YouTube, I usually lock it to video legal range. If I'm delivering for film or something else, then I don't lock it to video range. Uh, I also have it outputting to 10-bit, not 8-bit, so that if I can call it correct, and I'm outputting it in 4K. Now, just to give an, an idea of how that's working, my screen again here. So you see, this is how it's working. Like, I basically, on this side here, um, I have my 10-bit um, output without video levels. And then in here, I have my Rex 9 output from the Blackmagic, and then I have my scopes to watch while I'm doing color correction. Um, and then, of course, on my main monitor, I have my Rex 9 set as well. Uh, let me just go back to Nuke again. And so the reason I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to show you a couple of tricks that I usually do. Um, so this is a, a typical color correction. This, is, this was a bespoke color correction I did specifically for this video. Um, and the reason I wanted to show you is because these are kind of the kind of tips and tricks that I can probably share on this session. Um, so I tend to be very organized when I call a correct inside of Nuke. And of course, like I said, you can do it in DaVinci. You can do it in Fusion as well if you want to. Um, I'm going to do it on the side here. Um, and I tend to start with a piece of footage, um, raw. And this has been linearized in DaVinci. Um, I then... Sometimes I'm lucky and I get the bar, like I get the color charts. Uh, depends on, um, you know, who was shooting it. Of course, the color charts are very helpful for you to match scenes. There's a really nice Nukipedia plugin to do that. Um, and then uh, you can basically use that also to check the white point, white point as well. So a lot of times I start by my balancing and my balancing tends to be just making sure I can remove any tint that has been involved on the scene. Now, I'm not going to do any balancing on this specific footage because this footage has been balanced on set. So we we did basic we did basic um, white balance on set with an actual uh, gray chart. So this is balanced for the lighting we had on set. So I'm not going to balance it, but. A lot of times that's how I do it. I basically start by balancing it with the color corrector so that I can remove all any tint from my color correction. This is what I call like a balance grade. You just start like that. And you can have this in Nuke or in Nuke Studio or in DaVinci and you can just start that way. After that, then I start doing my primary color correction. Now, primary color correction is what I call when you just do a, a major creative color correction or you do a, 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 an overhaul color correction that does not have any type of uh, other color correction on top. So for example, on, on this case here, I'm gonna open up this color corrector. You can kind of see that what I'm doing here, I'm actually gonna do this live so that you can ask, guys can kind of see it. So um, instead of watching it like that, I'm just gonna do it on the side here. So basically, you know, depending of course on client feedback, let's say that this is a bit um, darker and I want it to be a bit more moody. So let's say I'm gonna just go to the first frame so that we have the full image here. Uh, let's just go to the middle so we have a bit more. Uh, let's just do that. So I would start by just going in into my gamma and start tinting to the temperature of the image. So this means that I want to make sure that I give a, a feeling to the scene. So let's say if I give it a warmer feeling to it, of course, that's giving me my midtones a bit of a warmer look. So, you know, it starts to look like a summer day, really. If I give it a bluer tint, it starts to look more like a cold day, like almost like a horror film. And if I start getting in, in something in between, I start getting like this kind of like greenish tint into the image uh, that would really help on the scene. Now, if you look at my primary color correction here, you can kind of see that what I did was I introduced some a greenish tint into my mid-level gamma. So this is basically my master gamma node. Then inside the gain, I gave it a bit of a blue. And that really, if I just gamma up here a little bit so you can kind of see what I mean, you can kind of see that, that it just introduces on the highlights mainly a bit of blue tint. Um, and this, of course, together with on the shadows, on my mid-tone shadows, I start applying a bit of blue as well. And that really gives me that this kind of tone, tonality of getting some kind of blue tint into my shadows. Now, 
Of course, this means that, just gonna open up this up here and just go back to where it was. We started with something like this, you know, if you look at her here, and then we can kind of like start having a nicer tonality, a bit of a blue, this is a horror film, it's a short film, so a bit of a blue tint into it. Then after that, I have a separated color correction, which is not tinting. So I tend to separate my things. I usually have one color corrector that has, brings in some kind of tint into the image, brings in some kind of temperature, and then I have another color corrector that only brings luminosity and values. So as you can see here, I have a bit of contrast, a bit of less gamma, a bit of uh, gamma, a bit of gain on the shadows, and of course, a bit of uh, gamma and gain on the midtones. It's always nice to bring in the midtones, uh, especially if you wanna do things like this, like if you have the image here, by playing around with the midtones, you can kind of pump in only the real nice uh, parts of the skin, and you can kind of like really pop the image out by using the midtone gamma and gain. Um, and especially in here, if you look at this thing here, you can kind of see that we started with this, and now we have a much nicer image. I'm just gonna give you more space to actually see this otherwise it's going to be hard you hard for you to kind of see i'm using it i'm not using 4k because of the stream of course so i'm kind of have to make it a bit smaller um so in a way then from there i have what i call a secondary color correction secondary color corrections for me or when i do bespoke color corrections with masks that means when you're doing color correction with object IDs, that means when you're doing color correction with masks. In this case, in this situation, I'm doing a mask on her. I just wanna pump her out in the scene. And this is just a really rough roto. This is very common on color space, like when you do Da Vinci, like when you do da Vinci color correction or base light, you do a lot of these soft masks. And you tend to be quite soft on them. And then of course they are animated as well so that you can kind of pop the main actor out of the scene, you know, especially when you look at it from the back there. So. You see, this really allows me to just pop in the, the, the color correction. Now, secondary color correction tends to be something that is really good for telling stories. You know, it's like it's almost like when you're telling like a creative story, everyone should be looking at her. That's the idea. Um, I also have another secondary color correction here, and this is mainly... Um, uh, so this secondary, secondary color correction is basically toning down the top here. You notice probably that I have, we had a huge light on the back of the books here. So by using this gamma and a radial here, I'm basically just reducing with using the multiply, just reducing basically the overexposure of the books. And again, this is a storytelling driven color correction because I'm basically removing some of the highlights on the back there so that you just don't see some of, so much of them. Now, one thing that I notice is that if you look really closely here, especially if, we, if you look at the 4K monitors on my desk, the image is quite soft. And this is because, uh, and also I'm using Canon lenses, so it's, it's a bit, it's, it's not as sharp as it should. So I'm using here a technique called the eye-pass filter, and this is something you can usually do it in Photoshop. Um, so the way that this works is basically you just do uh, an extra stream of the image. The way that this works is this way. We basically spread the image into two streams. We have one, which is a blur, and this blur, you'll need to, be, uh, uh, you'll need to see what's gonna happen on this blur. I'm gonna leave it open here. And then we have the blurred version, which at the moment is blurring of five, it's blurring with a merge minus. So basically, uh, once I, basically I'm minusing uh, the blur version with the normal version. I'm just gonna gamma up so you can kind of see. What that gives you is this kind of horrible thing. Uh, this is what we call like a blur mask. It's basically minusing the blur with the normal image. You basically, it's almost like a fancy edge detector, you know? And um, once that's done, I then shuffle out just some white into the alpha channel. I desaturated that a bit because I don't want to bring in from that high pass uh, color correction. I don't want to bring in all these little, like these horrible chromatic aberrations. So I remove that. And then at the same time, I have a constant here. Now the constant is set to 0 0.5 at the moment. Uh, it's basically just a pure uh, gray and I'm plusing it on top of my high pass filter. Now, if I gamma this uh, down, you can kind of see it. I'm just gonna like f-stop it down so you can kind of see it. It's very hard to see. Uh, let's see here, but you can kind of see the outlines here. And so this is like my mask um, of sharpen that I have here. You can kind of clearly see your face here. And then once this is ready, um, what I do then is I go back to my image here um, and then I basically just merge it on top. Um, now, 
you can kind of see if I zoom into her face and I see this is what I did. Like I outputted Gwent out, high passed with the blur. So basically blurred and then minused it. Then from there, we basically saturated, then we plussed it with the, with the gray, um, and then basically we did an overlay. So now this overlay here, you can clearly see that without the overlay, we have a very soft image. And this softness, like I said, is coming from the lens and it's coming from the camera. Um, and of course, that means that I, if I do an overlay, you can kind of see that I've recovered some of the detail. Now, I also recovered detail from the books here. Uh, you can kind of see them. You can also see them from even her hands here as well. You can kind of see that you have recovered some of the detail from the wood uh, of the seat, even from the skin as well. Even the details on the skin are back as well. Gets a bit more noisy, of course, and especially the detail of the hair. That all kind of goes back. If you look at, for example, here, the detail on the hair on the, and, and also the skin is kind of back. Now, um, you're, probably get, you're probably looking into this thing and noticing that I have a lock tool in here. The reason I do that is whenever I do sharpen masks, which is what this is, I tend to do first a lock to lin. The reason I do a lock to lin is that this lock to lin is set from linear to log. And that means that I rush, I basically lift the entire image up so we don't have no blacks and we have no whites. And, and that means that then I can basically apply my sharpens and then I can do a reverse lock to lin, which is log to lin. So if the first one was a lin to log, the second one is log to lin. So whenever I do reformatting, aggressive reformatting, or I do sharpen, I usually do these things. I also have a sh another sharpen node here, so sharpening even more the image. So I'm going to show you before and after, uh, after these two things. So basically, this is basically just a, sh a sharpen node. This sharpen node is set to default of tree, Then I have an overlay of the scene. And as you can see from my original image, I have this. And then at the end of the image, I have a much sharper much defined image, and especially when you look at it from the color correction monitor here on the SW320 from BenQ, you can kind of see a lot more sharp and going on here on the image. Now, the other thing you want to keep in mind is this blur setting. So if you look at the overlay that I have here, this blur, which was setting for this blur here, if I uh, put nothing, of course, nothing will be sharpened. If, of course, if I exaggerate, you start getting a really awkward image. So you need to be careful with this blur. Uh, if, for example, if you, if you, let me just put 100 to show you what that, what, that, what that means. If I put 100 of blur on the image and then I minus it with the image, I basically what I get is I get this really awkward HDR look which maybe is something you want, but <laughs> it doesn't really work, look very well. Um, so I tend to like not put too much. I try to blur as much as I can without making it horrible, you know? So, you know, you kind of start with one and you can kind of go up and have a few other things. So I would say that maybe I can go all the way to five or maybe six. That's going to be the maximum I'm going to do. And that's going to give me a lot of detail, especially on the teeth. And of course, then I have another problem that I need to fix, which is color, like chromatic aberration. But <laughs> that's yet another problem uh, that we're not going to talk about today because we are almost, almost running out of time. Um, this always happens when we're having fun, you know? Like I, I thought that, that I would be able to open up, uh, you know, three shots. That was my plan. I had three shots to show you. I've only opened one, and uh, we already are running out of time. So I'm going to really, really, really quickly just show you the rest of the stuff I have here. So after that, I have another thing here, which is a bloom. I'm a big fan of blooms and highlights. And so, for example, in here, I do another stream, and basically I use a color corrector to lower the multiplication quite a lot and the gamma quite a lot, so you barely see and just kind of only keep the highlights. Then I have a clamp to just make sure all these highlights are broken and not actually uh, using. Then I have some what I call the TX Bloom. This is a gizmo from Thomas Lefebvre. I'm sure I'm but but butchering his name. And this is a bloom effect from Nukipedia. And that gives you something like this. It basically gets you a little nice bloom on the highlights and a little nice bloom on her teeth and a little nice bloom on the highlights on, on the whole image. And then I basically just merge it on top of the screen. And, and that is very subtle. You can kind of see it down here. You can kind of see it, especially on the highlights here, if you look at her high, you can kind of see it has like a little tint of highlight there just to help the image basically diffuse it. Then I also have another glow here. So I have a, a specific glow here. And this is a glow 
that I have done a huge lower tolerance and a very low brightness in a very big size. I crop it, and then I merge it on top. And this gives me this kind of diffusing. And of course, this is a bit too much. I'm going to just lower it a bit. Um, so if I just basically just go down here, I get like a bit less diffuse. And then I have another glow in here, which is a more aggressive glow with a lower size and a higher tolerance. And that gives me a bigger highlight on these images here. So what I will do is I'm just going to reduce this quite a lot because it was a bit too much. So these glows and these, ten these tends to give you this kind of thing, you know, basically gives you a nice diffuse on the image. So you get a nice diffuse here on the books. You get a nice diffuse on the skin. And it basically just balances a little bit of a scatter of light in between the skin. You see here, even here, you have like the skin tone kind of scattering to the top of the, the, the hair as well, which is really nice. Uh, and then at the end, I have uh, some final tweaks. I have a vignette. Usually vignettes, what I do is I use a radial. Uh, and then I have a radial which is set like that. And then, of course, the radial, I can position it wherever I want to do a vignette. Um, I usually do two-stage vignettes. Um, I usually tend to have um, the vignette allows you... I'm going to just zoom out and show you that thing in general. The vignette basically allows you to just focus on her you know she's the main character of the film and again this is uh, color correction on the narrative point of view you know you want to make sure people look at her and then i pump out her a bit more so this radial is just on the middle here and i could have even like moved it a bit more to her and basically that's what it does it basically gives me the tonality on the on the sides goes down and then i look more at her then, of course, I have another little cheek and sharpen here, and then I have some grain. Now, of course, the grain, this is just a Luma picture grain. I would, of course, use the real grain from the scene. But I'm just going to show you really quickly how the original image looked like and how the final image looked like, so that you can kind of have a look at how this works. Now, this is the original footage, and as you can see, the original footage, you had the huge overexposure on the books here, you had very low light on her face. <laughs> Basically, I'm becoming the DOP now. <laughs> I know, but this is a short film made by me, so I can do whatever I want. Uh, and as you can see, the books were too exposed. She was too low exposed and she was too blurred. Now, at the end, of course, this might not work for all the shots. This is, of course, a, a very short um, uh, workshop I'm doing. But as you can see, the books are now gone. I can kind of see this guy here a bit more now. I can, can kind of see his, his hand now. I can clearly see her, her little nice highlights on the locks of hair. I can kind of see her skin. She's much more sharp now as well. She was very blurry. Now she's much more sharp. And I have this nice tonality of the actual noise on the back there. And then I can kind of like just play back this and, and kind of get it to work. Um, so just recapping because we're running out of time this would be the process. I would start with the original footage. I would then balance the footage so I could lose all the tint if I wouldn't have done a balance on set. I then would do a primary color correction to get some blue into it. I would do a secondary color correction to pump the image a bit higher. I would do a secondary color correction to get her more out of the image with a softened mask. I would then do another color correction to reduce the exposure of the books down there because I don't want anyone to look at these books. I want people to look at her. Then I have a high pass filter, which basically gives me a bit of more sharpen on the image down there. Um, and this is sharpen masking. And don't forget that I can also mask these sharpens with rotos if I would like to. Then I have a bit of bloom going on with three blooms, uh, one made by the TX bloom, two made by the glows. Then I have a bit of a vignette. I have a bit of an inverse vignette. Then I have some sharpen, some soft clipping because I want to deliver this to YouTube. And then I have like my grain, which would have been the real grain. Um, and this would be the process that I would do to almost every shot. And now if I had a timeline in Nuke Studio, I would have done all these color correctors shot by shot. Now, the main reason I was showing you my equipment in the beginning was mainly because I wanted to let you know that to do these kind of things, you do need to have the proper equipment, you know. I can't do these kind of aggressive color corrections without making sure I have the proper uh, equipment to see it, you know. Without having, without having this 10-bit monitor here, 
I wouldn't be able to really judge if my color correction was going too far. And without having my scopes here, I wouldn't really know if I was going too red or too blue, and I wouldn't know if I was going berserk with my highlights. Because a lot of times when people don't really properly calibrate their monitors, they basically are color correcting blind. It's kind of what happens, really. But, um, but anyway, like um, we are already running out of time. Unfortunately, I won't have time to open the other three shots that I had. But uh, let me just go back to my keynote. And I just wanted to do like um, a last minute thing that I wanted to show you before we go to the Q&A. So first of all, I will share this with you guys uh, after when you get the, the link. But if you, wanna, if you guys want to know more about some proper color correction pipeline, you should definitely look into uh, Netflix. So Netflix has a specific documentation. And again, I'll share these links with you guys later. So Netflix has specific documentation of how you should color correct. And like you see here, uh, we, did, we didn't do a Dolby Vision or an HDR. We did an SDR color correction here. As you can see, the footage goes into the VFX and we have an Rex 9 monitor to view it. And then, of course, it would have been mastered in a, in a DCP to be outputted. So Netflix has a lot of information if you want to like study a bit more about a professional pipeline. Also, would would advise you to go to Nukipedia. Nukipedia has a very nice um, uh, little short tutorial of how to use uh, Aces workflow uh, inside of Nuke and how to set it up and how to actually run it properly. Um, there's two parts to it. That, so, so basically, there's like two of them. If you want to know more, you can really geek out with this book. Uh, this is a digital video in HD algorithms and interfaces. This book from uh, Charles Poynton, it's amazing, but it's very heavy. It's like a mathematical book about color correction, about sharpen, about sRGB, about color. Really good book to know. Also, the Visual Effects Handbook, Visual Effects Society, is a very good book for standard processes of color correction if you want to have a look. I would also highly recommend you to look at the Art and Science of Digital Compositing uh, from Ron Brickman. And this book, of course, has a lot of good information about color space. And I also would uh, advise you, sorry, I went a bit too far here. <laughs> I'm on Amazon. I would also, of course, always recommend Steve Wright's book, especially the latest edition that he's made. Uh, this is, I think, the fourth edition, yeah. And on the fourth edition, he also has a chapter dedicated to open color IO. And you can really read it and a little bit more about it. Would really also recommend you to uh, read this book if you want to know a bit more how the visual effects industry is kind of like uh, uh, moving on to the f to the future. It's called Inside VFX, and uh, I also would recommend highly this book uh, from my dear friend Ian Falks. And basically, this is a bunch of interviews uh, with visual effects supervisors. It's called Master Effects. Last but not least, I would recommend the best book of Stanley Kubrick, uh, which is called Kubrick, the Definition, the Definite Edition. And then I would also recommend for all your geeks out there that want to know, know more about light, you can also look at Light for Visual Artists, Understanding and Using Light in Art and Design. Again, if you're going to do color correction, you know you need to know more about light. And to wrap up, I'm going to finish with the most geeky of these books, which is the American Cinematographer Manual, which has a lot of information about light, cinematography, lenses, and so what not. So um, before we go into the q and I just would like to do one last shameless promotion. Um, basically, you should definitely follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's uh, Hugo C. Guerre. Hugo C. Guerre, if you want to check some of my webinars if you want to check some of my videos you know and basically follow uh, some of my events i'm always talking all over the world uh, you also should check out my youtube channel eventually this webinar in a couple of days will show up on my youtube channel so you'll be able to see this webinar again or you'll be able to share it with other people uh, so you Hugo's desk on youtube uh, please help me to get to 15,000 subscribers i'm only on 14,000 right now um, you should also, if you want to be part of my community and actually vote for my next videos and actually even be part of, uh, you know, uh, of private conversations on Discord and private conversations on Facebook and even have uh, uh, private perks, you should support my YouTube channel on Patreon uh, like these 142 Patreons did. 
And last but not least, if you want to learn more about Nuke, you should definitely sign up for our Hugo's Desk Nuke Online Compositing. This was a course we did for Kickstarter. Of course, the Kickstarter is over. But me and Ricardo Ferreira have joined forces to do this uh, massive 15-week compositing course if you want to know more about Nuke. I, we are currently on the Slacker campaign, so if you still want to sign up, just contact us either on Twitter or contact us anywhere else, and we can, you can still sign up to the course. The course will start in a couple of weeks. Um, and that's pretty much it. So thank you so much for watching this webinar. And now let's kind of like move on to the Q&A session. Uh, really, so that we can kind of see if you guys have questions to to ask. Uh, so let's move on to the to the Q and I. Hopefully, you see me now. So let's start with the web with the questions. Then uh, I'm just gonna go into the questions section here and the chat and see what kind of questions I have here. So okay, so I have one question here from Julian. Um, so uh, Julian asks, maybe it's off subject. But do you have a classic workflow between softwares? Or, the, or does it depend on the input and the wanted result? Good hardware needs good software. So uh, I'm not entirely sure, Julian, what, what you mean with this. Like you're asking me, do you have a classic workflow between softwares? Uh, are you talking about color space workflow between? I'm guessing that's what you mean. Um, basically, that's that, I think that's what you mean. If it's if it if that's what you mean, Julian, if I have a classic workflow, currently I'm using Aces between all my softwares. Of course, it fails a bit with some softwares. So if I'm using Photoshop or if I'm using After Effects, I can't really use Aces um, as I should, like I, as I properly could. Um, I hope that's what you mean. I'm using Aces, but if I don't, if I can't use Aces, if I use a legacy workflow. I basically use a Rex and Zonine workflow uh, in all my LUTs, in all my viewers on After Effects, on, on Nuke, and on everywhere I work so that I can deliver for television or broadcast. And if I'm using for YouTube or for cinematics, I usually use sRGB for the whole classic workflow. I hope that's what you mean. Um, I'm sorry I, if, I, if I'm not totally understanding your question. Um, maybe you can ask me again later on, or maybe we can talk uh, in Skype later on. Uh, just reach out if you want to. I have another question here from Kevin Larson. Uh, he asks, he, Kevin Larson asks, curious if you're using the other Mac towers for rendering or to separate non-composting tasks to other machines. That's an excellent question, uh, uh, Kevin. So basically, the other machines, I have, as you saw, three extra Mac Pros, and I have two extra Mac Minis. So one of my Mac Minis is the one I use for Skype, Discord, Facebook, Netflix. And that's actually, uh, if, I share, um, if I share my screen again, sorry. So you see, I have two Mac Minis here. This is one Mac Mini that's another Mac Mini. So this Mac Mini is connected to this screen. And this screen, I basically have Netflix, YouTube, Skype, Discord, or anything that I do not want to process on the main machine. Because you guys might not know this, but Skype is quite heavy. If you have Skype, you have Discord, if you have YouTube, they will really take a lot of resources from your CPU. So I, I use this Mac Mini just for that. The other Mac Mini is just a support Mac Mini for background rendering for Nuke Studio, Nuke, or any other 3D application. Then, my main machine, I only run creative software. That means I'm only running Nuke, I'm only running Photoshop, only running After Effects. That means I never have anything else on, on it. Like, I don't have uh, Skype, I don't have YouTube on it, so I don't uh, bring down my resources. The other three uh, Mac Pros, one of them is the one that has the Quadro 5000, which is the fastest card I have. That one is my secondary machine. That means I always have it on with my timeline. So imagine if I'm compositing 10 shots, I usually have Nuke Studio with my 10 shots on this machine. And that means I can play back all of it always at all times. And so I can be on shot one, shot two, shot three in Nuke in my main machine, and I basically can have my timeline on my secondary machine. Now, one thing I also wanted to, to, know, to, to let you know is that if you look down here, up here, um, you see um, this monitor here has two inputs. So if I swap the input, I'm going to show you what I mean. Um, I can actually have, so you see, 
this output here is coming now from the other machine. So I have another Mac Pro there with also a Blackmagic deck link. So basically this Blackmagic is the second Blackmagic card I have. And this means I can have my edit, I can see my scopes. And on my main machine, I still have my deck link output for my main composite. So this was the Nuke script we were running on the workshop. And this is now the other Nuke script that I'm running on my secondary Mac Pro. So then this Mac Pro and that Mac Pro, those are specifically made for background rendering. So I basically have, uh, um, basically have licenses of new condom, like farm licenses, and they're connected with a farm software. And they basically render Modo, they render Redshift, they render Maya, they render Nuke, they render anything I need in the background uh, whenever I need. So I don't always have them always, always on, you know, that, that's not the case, really. Um, so cool. I hope that that helped on the answer. Let me just go back to the questions again. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, so that was Kevin Larson. Another question I have here from Nicola. You just touched briefly on the legal and full range between post-production departments. So how do you make sure that there are not too many steps of conversions from one to the other? And if you're working on one project with live action form, multiple cameras with different color spaces, do you stick with the original one or do you rather convert everything to the same one? This is an excellent question, Nicola. So here's the thing. I've done that many times at the mill where we had an Alexa camera, uh, you know, running. And at the same time, we had a C300 uh, filming from Canon. And also we had a 5D. And then also we had a red camera. This means I have the red camera, which has the red color space. Then I have the Alexa, which has the Alexa color space. And then it has the, I have the C300, which has the lock Canon color space. And then I might have a Blackmagic camera like one of these on the top here. And that has the color space from Blackmagic. So this is all a big mess. So it really depends on what, how you want to approach the project. If I'm controlling the project from scratch, I would much prefer to go to an application like DaVinci or an application like Baselight and basically linearize all the shots to one single LUT. That means every single thing matches when I load them into Nuke so that whenever people are working, they have access to the actual color space that I've already assigned on the pre-grade. That's really important because there's no confusion. Now, the reason I was showing you a red file inside of Nuke is because I was showing you color space uh, ISO. Now, it's not very common for compositors to use that color space inside of Nuke. That's not common. So I would highly recommend for you to convert everything you have to one LUT. You can either linearize everything, or if you want, you can convert it to an Alexa color space. Like imagine you convert everything to a log Alexa. That's all, always also a good way to do it as well. So I hope that answered the question, Nicola. Uh, so Gorav asks, how do I match actual camera motion blur to my CG passes for live action? That's an excellent question. So if you have camera motion blur in the scene, there's a couple of ways of doing it. If your CG has been rendered with the proper camera settings, you know, if you imagine if you go to uh, Maya and you're using Arnold and you put the proper ISO settings on your camera inside of Maya and you put your proper shutter speed and you put your proper f-stops in your camera, then the result of Arnold or Redshift will be the correct motion blur and it will be the correct grain and it will be the correct sensor for that render. So it is possible to do that. Now, if you don't have access to actually making the camera properly, then what you could do is you can mimic it by using the vector blur inside of Nuke, or you can basically, if everything fails, you can use the motion blur node in Nuke, or even the motion blur plugin in After Effects to mimic motion blur by trying to mimic. Now, motion blur, don't forget, is connected with the shutter speed. So if your shutter of your camera was 0.5, you know, if it was 180, which is usually a shutter of 0.5, then you can just set the motion blur to 0.5 and you'll get an equivalent shutter of 180. If your shutter was a different, like if you use the 213 shutter or if you use the 300 shutter, then you have to just experiment with your shutter settings on the motion blur uh, node. There's, of course, a third option, which happens a lot. A lot of times when you fail to do good motion blur, especially if it's a couple of frames, there's always a way for you to paint motion blur using the roto paint tool or using smudging to try to paint motion blur. That also works as well. So again, I hope that worked for your answering you. 
we have a lot of questions here. Uh, I'm just going to keep going until I'm uh, kicked out <laughs> by BenQ. Uh, so my next question is from Giancarlo Wilson. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Giancarlo. Um, so Giancarlo is asking, what is your workflow to grading CG into real footage? I have seen like four different ways to grade CG with the grade node. Well, that's a good question, Giancarlo. There is a lot of ways of doing the same thing. Don't forget that. My main way of uh, color correcting CG into real footage is to start off the CG with proper lighting calibration. So let's, for example, imagine if you have your footage and your footage was shot with a red camera and you actually used your color charts and you've measured the lighting, you actually know the Kelvin temperature of the camera. You actually know the f-stop of the camera. You actually even took photos of the lights that were on set, and you know exactly how much light intensity you had on set. So I do that a lot. I, I tend to use this like 360 camera to do that, uh, so that I can just have like a, an overview of the entire set. And if you have all that information, then on the CG side, you can actually put your CG with the correct light intensities and you can match the light directions with HDRs, you can match the light directions with your intensity values of your lights because you can match them to the real lights on set and not to mention you should definitely match, if, for example, if you use a V-Ray camera, you can match the ISO, you can match the shutter speed so that you have a perfect camera. That would always already be a really good step to match the color. Once you're there, then I would recommend you to try to use the grade node using black point and white point to try to match to the footage. So basically, you can do it this on, on several ways. You can either just like use the gamma and the f-stop slider in Nuke to try to discover the black point and the white point of the image. Of course, I'm now just navigating and just explaining a lot to you, but this entire process you can find a video on my YouTube channel uh, from Hugo's desk that explains this, so you can just definitely check that out. So I hope you ha I've answered your question, Gian Giancarlo. Now, I have a question here from Jeremy. If Photoshop is used for matte paintings, what file type is exported to use in Nuke? So Jeremy, when I use Photoshop, I basically use always the original Photoshop file first. Uh, so I'll actually show you that uh, because I think you still see my screen. Uh, so I'm actually going to show you that what I mean. So if, if I, for example, read in here a Photoshop file, I'm just going to go into volumes here and let's see here. So I'll, I'll go into mm, 2D map paintings. Uh, I'm just going to go into, let's see here, Ali. So that would be the one I'm going to use. Uh, and this is going to be Dark Alley DMP uh, 7. So, so this is a matte painting from a project I directed quite a while ago. Uh, and this is the uh, matte painting. Uh, I'm just going to gamma up a little bit so you can kind of see it. And this is the original PSD file. Now, the reason I bring in the original PSD file is because I just want to double check all the layers and I want to double check everything is there. And once I have it here, then I press this button here called Breakout Layers. When I press the Breakout Layers, you basically get a rebuild of the layers from Photoshop. Now, not always it works. Like if I compare the result of my rebuild with the original matte painting, so this is the original matte painting, and this is the rebuild. If you just give it a second, it will show up. It will take a little bit of time to load because it's quite heavy, as you can see. It's a 5K matte painting. So it takes a while to load, but uh, eventually it will load if you just give it a second. So while this is loading, I'm just gonna explain, I usually bring in the PSD and I look at it and I see if it's all working and if it's all matching, uh, it's gonna take too long to load. So I'm, not, I'm gonna give up on this. Once I have that and I kind of work from here, then I, it's a backwards and forwards with my matte painter. So I usually go into uh, Photoshop and just maybe remove some layers. Maybe just group some layers together so that it's a bit more easy. So there's always one master Photoshop file which has all the layers. And I tend to have a second Photoshop layer which has less layers. It's a bit more simplified so that you can actually, uh, you know, uh, navigate it on Nuke. And once I'm happy with that, what I do do, and I really recommend you guys doing that, is to actually render out, I'm just going to do that really quickly here, render out the same Photoshop file that you're happy with as an EXR. This means I'm going to render it as an EXR. So if I render this just as an EXR really quickly, just give it a second here for it to render. 
The reason I'm doing the XR is because Photoshop is not really optimized for Nuke at all. So Photoshop files in Nuke are super slow. And this is probably because it's debarring the Photoshop file as it goes. Now, the native format of Nuke is EXR. So you want to use an EXR for everything. And that's why I'm converting this Photoshop file, once I'm happy with it, to an EXR. And if you just give it a second, it will be done. So now I have the same exact matte painting. Uh, and I can go in here to my scene. I have an EXR. So you see, you can clearly see it here. The Photoshop file was 400 megs. The same exact EXR is much smaller. Now, it's smaller, of course, because I didn't render the layers. Because by default, it's set to sRGB. Uh, but if you want all the layers, you can also, of course, do all layers. And then, of course, I can render it again. And then you'll get every single layer of the Photoshop file inside that EXR as well. So I'm going to leave this rendering and then move on to the, to the other part of the question. So the other part of the question regarding color space, I always have my Photoshop files, of course, as sRGB because you can't really do much about it. Like Photoshop works in sRGB. So that means that if you do have highlights that have been broken inside Photoshop, you have to make sure your matte painter does not make anything that is actually overexposed in, in that matte painting. Otherwise, you're going to have problems with the sRGB color space. You're basically going to clamp your matte painting. I'll go back to this once it's done. Uh, and in the meantime, I have another question here. So uh, one question from Brad. Um, so hi, Hugo. You mentioned your workflow for Blackmagic DNGs. I'm just wondering if you have had the chance to try the new Blackmagic RAW codec. And if, what, and if so, what do you think of it? So Brad, that is an excellent question. I actually have not done a production yet with the new Blackmagic RAW codec. I have started shooting something to try it, but I haven't tried it yet. I am sure it will be the best choice because Cinema DNG is terrible. It's really not worth your time. So whenever you can, sorry. Whenever you can, you should try to use another format. I tend to use Apple ProRes in my Blackmagic camera, or I use, I'm now gonna start using the RAW codec. Don't worry, Brad, because eventually, once I learn how the Blackmagic RAW codec works, I will definitely make a YouTube video about it. Um, now, Brad, I hope that answered your question. Now, going back to the Photoshop file here. So I'm just going to uh, let him know that I want nearest frame, and I'm just going to update. And so, as you can see here, this is now the Photoshop file in EXR format. And now, if I go here, I still have all the layers I need. And I can tell you that from experience, if I have a 5K or an 8K Photoshop file, in Nuke, if I'm using an 8K Photoshop file to do projections, it can take about half an hour to render one shot. And if I use an EXR, it could take five minutes. Like, I've noticed at least a 10 times uh, full, like it's literally almost 10 times faster to use an EXR with the same exact file. Now, when you look at the sizes as well, the Photoshop file is 400 megs. The EXR, which is exactly the same with all the layers, is only 265. So not only Photoshop is slower, but Photoshop is heavier, which means it's worse for management of files and everything else. So I hope that it answered your question. Um, who asked the question was, uh, sorry, Jeremy. So I hope that answered your question, Jeremy. So moving on to other questions. Um, so I have, who asked this? Okay, Yannick from France. So hi, Hugo, I'm Yannick from France. So I'm currently learning compositing with Nuke and I would like to know which is the most skill asked and expected to land in the studio. Is it camera projection? Is it 2D set extension? Is it color correction? So, Yannick, this is a great question. If you want to start as a compositor, if you're going to start as a junior, actually, it's none of these. As a junior, you're really not going to do camera projections. You might do some 2D set extensions. I do not believe you'll do color correction like I'm doing. Color correction is usually dealt with seniors and with senior staff. It's not even that common to do color correction inside of Nuke. I would recommend you to learn a lot about rotopaint, about... Uh, making uh, rotoscoping, about doing uh, patches, about painting things out, uh, removing rigs, removing wires, all those kind of things is what you want to make sure you learn 
to become a good junior composter. That's what I would advise you, Yannick. Now, if you're not a junior, if you ask this question because you were already a senior, or maybe in, let's imagine that you're an After Effects artist and you want to transition to Nuke, if you already have a showreel as an artist and if you're a really good After Effects artist, then it's a different question. Then you basically just have to trans trans transmit your uh, knowledge from After Effects to Nuke, which means then, yes, then you should start with camera projections to deset extensions and color correction because you're a more senior artist. I don't know which one you want, so that's why I don't know. Now, I have a question here from Adam. Uh, Ad, uh, Hugo, can you recommend any cloud remote rendering solution for Nuke? I'm working on my laptop workstation and... Uh, and now industry tends to go to 4K. Yes, it's, you're right, Adam. Uh, industry goes to 4K a lot now. And so I would highly recommend, if you want a rendering solution for Nuke, I would actually look into Elada or Etera. Sorry, Etera. Let's not call it Elada anymore. Um, so this would be... Uh, let me just uh, get a new window here. Um, so just uh, open up. So it's called Etera. And this is uh, basically a platform from cloud, uh, cloud platform from Google and from uh, the Foundry. And this allows you to run Nuke on the cloud. It allows you to run Houdini. It allows you to run um, uh, also uh, Nuke Studio in Modo in Mari. Uh, and it all, it's all through the cloud and you can render it through the cloud. I have a video review on it on my YouTube channel. You should really check it out. To my knowledge, I think this is really the only one that is offering Nuke as a rendering on the cloud at the moment. But uh, maybe contact me later and I can see if I can find more. I have another question here, and this is a question that apparently came from a lot of people, not from a specific person. Why are you using Mac OS and not Windows? Um, so this is a great question. Like The reason I'm using Mac OS is because of per personal preference, you know. Uh, at the mill, and you'll probably find this if you go to a big facility, uh, we use Linux. And we use Linux and Mac, basically, because Linux doesn't run Photoshop and After Effects, so we had to use Mac machines. And the reason we use Linux was because Linux is uh, easier to expand if you, you know, if you want to kind of like have um, a pipeline, if you want to expand to a lot of computers, Linux is easier. The reason I use Mac is because I came from Linux and Mac is similar to Linux and it's a lot similar, especially on the code backend. And so I just prefer, it's a personal reason that I use Mac OS. Uh, I like Mac OS. Mac OS is my favorite, Mac o my, my favorite OS. I've used Windows many times. I've used Windows even in production. But I just prefer the way Mac OS feels and the way Mac OS runs. And especially for me, coming from Linux, on Linux, uh, the, the, the machine, the software, is very light. That means Nuke is using all the resources of the machine. And I feel the same on Mac OS. Mac OS is a very light uh, OS. So that means Nuke is really using a lot of the RAM and a lot of the CPU power. And I notice when I benchmark it with Windows, I just get better results inside of Mac OS. But this is an absolutely personal uh, thing. And the other reason also that I use Mac OS is because I use Final Cut a lot. Like I use a lot of Final Cut X and, and I use a lot of Apple, Apple ProRes, especially because of my clients. Uh, a lot of people in the industry use uh, Apple ProRes. And so if you want to really use Apple ProRes properly with proper color space and proper encoding, I use Mac OS because of that, because it has native Apple ProRes uh, um, support. But if I do have to change, because of course Mac is now not really making a lot of workshop, workstations anymore, I'm hoping they make a new Mac Pro. But if they don't do a Mac Pro, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to swap to Windows. No, I'm just going to swap to Linux again, because that's what I used to use at, at the mill. And that's usually the best solution to have uh, you know, um, more scalability if you want to scale to other, to, uh, other, uh, other people. So, Okay, cool. So hope that answered the question. It's really like just a preference, a personal preference of mine. Um, I have nothing against Windows. Um, so is there any more questions? Or I think, oh, I think this is the last question. Okay. So um, I, would l I would love to thank, of, of course, thank you so much for watching this. Um, and thank you so much for being part of this uh, thing. I, I, I saw that we have still 100 people logged in. Uh, if you guys have more questions, uh, please... Just send me a tweet, you know, contact me on Twitter, contact me on Facebook, or contact me 
uh, on the uh, you guys can find me on social media I can answer more questions eventually this video will be shared with all of you uh, tomorrow and it will also be on Hugo's desk on YouTube so you guys can ask more questions on the actual uh, comments also on YouTube so thank you so much for being here and I'll see you guys next time and uh, have a great day goodbye